As a passionate geographer and as a long-term fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, it was a speaking invite I could hardly turn down, so I'm very pleased to be here. So is there a crisis in the countryside? Yes, undoubtedly. In my speech, I want to set out how there is a growing crisis in the rural economy, a growing crisis in the social cohesion of our rural communities, and a growing crisis in the rural environment. But the critical point I want to make tonight is that these crises are interlinked, and it will not be possible to solve one by ignoring the others. It will not be possible to revitalise our rural economy unless we address the threats to the rural environment. And addressing the environmental challenges will provide us with extraordinary opportunities to revitalise our rural economy and communities. I want to look briefly at four issues that make the extent of that crisis quite clear. Very quickly, let's, you won't be surprised if I tell you that the first one I want to look at is climate change. And just to understand the depth of how that poses a crisis for our countryside, this is the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment from just last year, published by the government, by PubDefra itself. And it goes into real depth about the risks that climate change poses to this country. I'll just give you a sense of it. Here's a table showing some of those risks, okay? If we zoom in a tiny bit of that, you just get a sense of, just looking at some of those headlines there, you can certainly get a sense of how climate change poses a very severe risk to our countryside over the next couple of decades. I'll come to him in a minute. The other threats I want to look at tonight are energy, and the crisis around energy, around agriculture, and around planning. But of course, issues like biodiversity are very important and affected by all four of those as well. Together, our approach to these four issues will set the framework through which economic and social development can take place in our rural environment. One reason I feel I need to emphasize tonight the case for a comprehensive and integrated approach to the crisis in our countryside is simply because, in my view, the coalition government is currently doing precisely the opposite to an integrated and comprehensive approach. Let me remind you of one of the central tenets of David Cameron's strategy to get the Conservatives into power ahead of the 2010 general election. He knew that the British people care deeply and passionately about the environment. In many ways, Britain could be seen as the birthplace of the conservation movement. And it is home, of course, to some of the world's largest environmental organisations, with memberships far, far larger than all the political parties combined. And so, in his attempt to go after the political centre ground and the also important floating voters, of course, he rebranded his party as Green. He literally rebranded. You remember that the Conservative Party used to have as its logo the red, white and blue torch? He changed that and replaced it with a blue and green tree. He did that so deliberately to go after that centre ground and after people, the many millions of people in this country that care about the environment. And then you might remember that just a couple of days after coming into power, he then famously pledged solemnly to make this the greenest government ever. Do you remember that? So how are we doing now on the 1,100th and 44th day of this supposed greenest government ever? Well, Friends of the Earth has long argued that environmental problems must be addressed in their wider social and economic context. And solutions to problems must be integrated across different sectors of our economy, between town and country, and across all the nations and regions of the UK. Above all, it is critical that the government, the government's environmental programme is coordinated across every government department. It must be central to each department's work, not some bolt on luxury or afterthought. And critically, it must be led by strong, well-informed ministers setting out the case for radical environmental action to other politicians, to business, and the general public, something called political leadership. Of course, the greenest government ever would be making a high priority of tackling the crisis in the countryside, wouldn't it? And at the centre of it all 
should be a Secretary of State for the Environment and Rural Affairs, resolute in his pursuit of those objectives, fully informed of the major environmental challenges facing this country and the wider world, and determined to leave a progressive, sustainable and green legacy on which his successors could build. Now, I'm a campaigner, and campaigners actually are naturally quite cheerful and optimistic people. Well, we have to be, if you think about it. We have to believe that change is possible. Otherwise, we won't make it into the office every Monday morning. So in that cheerful, optimistic spirit, I sat down on June the 7th to listen to BBC Radio 4's Any Questions programme. Now, splendidly, the programme brought together the Environment Secretary, Owen Patterson, up there, brought him to Mid Wales, the home of the Centre of Alternative Technology, which, as you know, has been working on sustainable energy and green technology for over 40 years. Now, with Mr. Patterson on the panel was the very strange, the anti-science, right-wing bloviator and climate change dismisser, James Dellingpole, who, quite frankly, I find hard to believe anyone can take seriously. So, excellent. Here was a chance for the Secretary of State for the Environment in supposedly the greenest government ever to seize the opportunity and make it clear that anthropogenic climate change is the principal threat, one of the principal threats to humanity, and that climate change deniers are anti-science, anti-reason, and destructive of our common home and future. And half an hour into the program comes the inevitable question on climate change. It's followed by a 60-second rant by James Dellingpole, which I shall not waste your time by analyzing. Then, two panel members, Peter Hain of Labour and Leanne Wood of Plaid Cymru, uh, rightly deride Dellingpole's answer and point out that the basic science of climate change is not in doubt and that its effects are already very visible. So next up comes Owen Patterson, our Environment Secretary. So here we go. He starts off by saying, I'm sitting like a rose between two thorns here. Well, actually, he's not. You know, he's sitting be between a very far-right ideologue and two people who at least understand the basics of the issue. But let's keep going with the substance of the answer. The next thing he says, very interestingly, is um, the climate has always been changing. It brings about a kind of sinking feeling. Because, yes, of course the climate has always been changing. Studying past climates is the absolute basics of climate science. And it's precisely our understanding of how and why the climate has changed in the past that leads to 99% of climate scientists to be so concerned about what's happening in the future. I always find it amazing when climate dismissers say that, as if no one's ever thought of it before, that the climate has changed in the past. But it is absolutely fundamental part of GCSE geography. And let's hope geography stays in the national curriculum. He went on. This is a really entertaining bit for those of you that know a bit more detail about past climates. I think in the Holocene, the Arctic melted completely, and you can see that there were beaches there when Greenland was occupied. You know, people growing crops. This is his precise transcript. So the climate's been going up and down, but the real question, which I think everyone's trying to address, is, is this influenced by man-made activity in recent years? And James actually is correct. The climate has not changed. The temperature has not changed in the last 17 years, and what I think we've got to be careful of is that there is almost certainly bound to be some influence by man-made activity. But I think we've just got to be rational. At that point, I'm very pleased to say you got a lot of that. But he went on. And make sure that the measures that we take to counter it don't actually cause more damage. So that is our Secretary of State for the Environment and Rural Affairs. It's really hard to know where to start with his answer, which sounds like some random effusion from one of the less able candidates in a Republican presidential primary. But I suppose a good big beginning would be to point out that Mr. Patterson doesn't actually seem to know what the Holocene era is, or the fact that actually we're still in it. Unless he's agreeing, of course, to those climate scientists who have suggested that we've now entered a new geological era, the Anthropocene, because of, yes, the effects of anthropogenic, i.e. human-caused climate change. It's rather ironic mistake for him to make, isn't it, therefore, to talk about back in the Holocene, which actually suggests he agrees with the suggestion to redefine where we are now as the Anthropocene. But anyway, compare our Secretary of State for the Environment, compare his tangle of words with Tuesday's speech by President Obama on the issue. 
where he spe spelled out in sharp language what inaction on the climate change would mean for the United States. He attacked the Republicans for their implacable insistence on denialism and obstruction and took long overdue action to try and cut emissions from US power plants. Now, you can criticize President Obama's record on environmental policy, although he has been working in exceptionally difficult circumstances. But you can never say that he doesn't understand what he's talking about. And there is no excuse for a minister of the Crown in the UK to be ignorant about this issue. Funny enough, you can find an excellent summary of the effects of climate change on a UK website. It's called The Impacts of Climate Change on the UK, and it's run by the government. And in fact, DEFRA has been very closely involved in it. So you, a good start for an integrated government might be for the Department of Environment minister to read one of his own web pages. And in case you think Mr. Patterson is a lone troglodyte in a government of ministers well informed on the basics of environmental and climate science, well, let's now take a look at the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which, as we have just seen, has an impressively informed website. Ministers from that department must understand the issue, surely. Surely they've read their own website. Well, step forward Energy Minister Michael Fallon. In his recent interview with The House magazine, he was asked for his personal views on climate change, and Mr Fallon said, you're getting me into theology now. I don't deal with that. He says, adding with a smile, that's the other side of the department, isn't it? You're not going to draw me on that. I've not had time to get into the great climate change debate yet. This is our energy minister. I do not have time all day, I'm afraid, to read these various tracts. There are lots of them, and it's a very polarised debate. Instinctively, I'm, well, anyway, I've not gone into it. Integrated, joined up government. Here is a minister even resisting being in one joined up department. Now, the extraordinary thing is, the British Isles is blessed with one of the best renewable energy resources anywhere in the world. You would have thought this so-called greenest government ever could and should be working to a plan to help revitalise our rural economy through a programme of renewable energy de development and energy efficiency measures. This would help us cut carbon emissions and provide a major opportunity for jobs and investment in the rural economy, right across the country, not just in a handful of areas. Do we really think we're going to benefit from this historic opportunity? Do we think we're going to realise that, those benefits, if the energy minister considers climate change to be a theology? Do we really think this historic opportunity is going to be realised if the government spends its time promoting dubious jam tomorrow solutions like shale gas? And we've seen a plethora of announcements on that just today. Prime Minister David Cameron has said on shale gas, there is a revolution underway. I want us to be part of that revolution. But yet again, we see this government taking an ideological, disjointed approach to policy making here, rather than an integrated, evidence-based approach. The government's own committee on climate change, the world-famous Tyndall Centre, even the International Energy Agency have all calculated, and I quote this from the IEA now, an accelerated global expansion of gas supply from unconventional resources puts CO2 emissions on a long-term trajectory consistent with a probable temperature rise of more than 3.5 degrees Celsius. Bear in mind that the difference between now and the last ice age is just about, on average, 5 degrees. And then you think about 3.5 degrees increase. That's really rather alarming. I don't think there'll be much room for chillaxing in a world that has warmed to that disastrous extent. Oh well, perhaps there'll be more joy to be found in the department that deals with agriculture. Why? Yeah. Right, okay. Well, that, of course, is Owen Patterson's department. And here again, we've seen him go with those of Jam Tomorrow Techie Fixes. Just last week, we saw him make the speech about promoting the virtues of GM food. It could have been, and maybe was, drafted by the biotech industry. Never mind that despite decades of research, there's been as yet no miracle GM crops that could really tackle the challenges of sustainable farming. Climate change, soil degradation, water shortages, lots of promises about potential GM crops in the future. But actually what we're seeing, we're seeing that kind of speculation. Actually that's a distraction from the opportunities that exist now. What I would like to see is a government focus on what actually exists and what needs to be done now. 
There is a crisis right now in our farming, causing misery for rural communities across Britain. Taking dairy farming as an example, here you have a largely dysfunctional sector with thousands of dairy farmers working on ever-shrinking margins. It's time to address that. What we should see there is the government intervening in that misfiring market to help the dairy industry move to an, a model that is good for UK agriculture, farming that is sustainable in its impact on the environment, profitable for farmers, and ethical in its treatment for animals. Instead, the government has promoted ineffectual voluntary codes um, with retailers and processors and ignored the trend towards more indoor dairy farms that simply accelerate the race to the bottom with even lower prices and damaged systems. So what we really need is a change here. But let's look briefly, very quickly, at planning policy. Again, we've seen there a very ideological attack by government on planning. In a joined-up greenest government ever, ministers will be ensuring that councils and housing associations were building and renovating homes for rent, using brownfield sites and empty properties as a first priority. That would help young people onto the housing ladder, boost jobs from plumbing to retailing, regenerating our towns and cities, and protect our countryside. But instead, George Osborne has attacked our planning controls, promoted building in the Green Belt, and at the same time as making Britain's housing crisis even worse by offering a daft mortgage subsidy. All in all, David Cameron's pledge to make this the greenest government ever is looking pretty hollow and cynical three years on. Now, with Friends of the Earth, we can do everything we can to try and make a difference here. Our campaign around bees has been incredibly successful, and that's an attempt at a campaign looking at all the many reasons why bees are in decline. We're reaching out, building partnerships with business, with organisations like the Women's Institute. We've got the support of over 200 MPs for a national bee action plan to really try and bring all that together. Green groups can do an awful lot, but they can be no substitute for proper government. We need a government that puts the environment and sustainable development at the heart of its work. We need one that coordinates properly across departments. And we need ministers to take a lead on the vital challenge of climate change, rather than waffling and staring vaguely at the ceiling to hide the reality that the ideology has blinded them to. In short, to deal with the countryside crisis, we need genuinely the greenest government ever. Now, I'm optimistic that one day we will get that. But I have to be honest, we haven't got, had that yet, these last 1,144 days. Thank you very much. You question, in my view, very rightly, the scientific credibility of those uh, who deny the effect of man-made climate change. Uh, some people have compared the scientific credibility of opposition to GM to the scientific credibility of questioning man-made climate change, saying, frankly, they're both ideological positions. You are ideologically opposed to GM and they are ideologically opposed to the man changing the climate. What do you make of that? Well, the first thing to understand is why is it that organisations, well, certainly why is Friends of the Earth been opposed to GM over this time? And actually, it's not fundamentally being frightened about the technology. You know, you've got to bear in mind, we support stem cell research. We actually support some forms of biotechnology. We don't have problems with that. I mean, you know, the Prince of Wales once talked about uh, let's not meddle with uh, God's invention or something like that. That's not been our perspective. That's not our concern. Our, our biggest concern around this has really been the social, environmental, economic and corporate context in which GM technology has been deployed. And also the fact that it, it tends to be an enormous distraction to all the other uh, solutions which are already here and now and can be deployed far quicker and far more effective and we know they work. And it, and it, is, it is a problem often with these debates. I mean, you know, personally, I'm a bit of a gadget man. I love technology. You know, I, it's, a, it's an embarrassing thing to admit because it doesn't really go with the brand. But, you know, I love it when I get a new mobile phone and so on. Uh, so I, I absolutely love new technology. Um, and the fear for me around GM and uh, other things is, is not that technology. But in the 21st century, when we see the pace of innovation growing faster than ever, we need a mature approach to technology, which isn't just seeing it as a silver bullet, just because something new comes along, it must be great. Let's look at really what the problem is. And if you look at the problem of how we're going to feed 9 billion people in the world and do it in a sustainable way, maybe one day GM might have some kind of contribution to make. But we're decades off from deploying that in a way that might really help. 
We can never be sure, I don't think we can be sure yet, whether we've got the real evidence, whether that's working. It's a huge distraction from the real solutions okay. which can be deployed now. 